Dear friends, Mr. President, Prime Ministers, Madam Secretary, dear Ministers General, our heroes, thank you very much that you are here and for our traditional Ukrainian lunch. Dear friend, thank you very much for what your country, your people, your nation doing for Ukraine. Ukrainians will never forget this. Thank you very much. But today, we will talk not, on, not only about thank you. Uh, friends of Ukraine now often say the West economy is 20, 20 times bigger than Russia's. Definitely, we have to win. But it's not so easy. Yes, the West economy is 20, 20 times bigger than Russia's, but the US and the European Union gave 0.4% and 0.3% of their GDP, respectively, for military support for Ukraine. Russia spends 40% of their budget on attacking Ukraine, between 6 and 8% of, of GDP, maybe even 10% of GDP. This compensates a 20-25 times bigger Western potential. And it's not only what Russia produces, also what Russia gets from Iran and North Korea. They have very small economies, but they have big military production. Russia's leaders say this war is existential. The West does not see this way yet. This is wrong. Size of your economy does not win a war in Ukraine. Not even what you plan to give later matter what you do now. Ukraine cannot hold the line much longer without enough weapons and ammunition. There is no time to wait until the United States and Europe figure out who is ready to give what and when. Of course, Ukrainians will keep fighting whatever happens and will never give up. But Ukraine can lose in the short term. Ukrainians are exhausted, have no ammunition. I talk to Ukrainian soldiers much. They say, if we knew the aid is coming, it would give us strength to reach this point. But as of now, we don't have this perspective. And what Ukraine losses in 2024, you cannot get back just because in 2025 you increase production. Many of you were here in 2022. You remember? It was a very dark moment. The West had waited too long to give Ukraine weapons. We knew a drama will happen because of this. And now in 2024 it can happen again. Don't hope it will not happen. Learn from 2022. Give more weapons now. Or you may regret your inaction even more than you did after February 2022. Europe and the West must switch their logic 180 degrees. Ukraine should not have to ask for weapons. You should proactively be proactively offering. Only then Ukrainians who do the impossible can preserve independence. Only this will create a chance for peace and security. Peace and security for you. 2022 was the year when everybody underestimated Ukraine. 2023 was the year when everybody underestimated our enemy. 2024 will be the moment of truth. And this year of truth, 2024, is in your hands. In big part, in your hands. Thank you very much for your attention. And Zani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victor. Um, I'm delighted to be back here again, uh, moderating this lunch. Uh, it's now the third time I've had the honor of doing this. The first time was, as you say, Victor, just a few days before the full-scale invasion. The second time last year, there was, I think, a moment of a mood of an upbeat mood in this room, a mood that had huge expectations for the counteroffensive. And now I think we meet again at a much more sober moment. 
this is the morning where the retreat from Alifadivka was announced. We are seeing an excruciating shortage of weapons in Ukraine. The US supplemental has not been passed. We saw yesterday with the killing of Alexei Navalny, yet again, just in case we needed any more proof of the kind of enemy Ukraine is up against. Uh, and just a few days ago, we had those comments from former President Trump uh, about NATO, which I think put into sharp relief the point, Victor, that you made, that this is a question for the future of Europe and the uncertainties that Europe faces more broadly. So I think this is a, a, an important and sober moment for us to have this conversation. And I think there's kind of two timeframes and two parameters. The first is in the short term, how to ensure, as you say, Victor, that Ukraine gets these weapons, what happens, what is needed in the short term. And then a broader term of Europe's future, Europe's future with Ukraine, Europe's security future, what that looks like in light of the Russia that we have and the United States that I'm, I'm not sure what direction the United States is going in. So it's that backdrop this conversation is going to occur. We have, as you can tell, a fantastic panel here. And there are also a number of you who uh, will be making remarks from the floor. Please, please keep your remarks brief because there are about 25 people who would like to speak in the next hour and a half, and you can do the maths. So no speeches. Um, but very, very briefly, Piotr Pavel, President of the Czech Republic, Kaya Kalas, Prime Minister of, the, of Estonia, Alexander de Croo, Prime Minister of Belgium, Secretary Hillary Clinton, former Secretary of State, uh, Meta Fredriksson, Prime Minister of Denmark, and of course, Nikolai Denkov, Prime Minister of Bulgaria. Thank you all for joining. It's testament to the just extraordinary importance of Ukraine, the sense of uh, solidarity, and indeed, Victor, the importance of this lunch that you have attracted this such a panel. Um, uh, President Pavel, I'm going to start with you because those of you who were here last year will remember that in a general mood of upbeat commentary, President Pavel was remarkably sober about what one should expect from a counteroffensive and what one should expect in terms of Ukraine's potential uh, on the battlefield and more broadly. So I wanted to ask you first, how do you see things today? Are you as worried as many of us are? And what is the route forward? Thank you and good afternoon to all of you. And I'm particularly pleased uh, to see uh, the uniforms of uh, Ukrainian soldiers. You have my great respect. Uh, first, uh, let me say that uh, I am uh, really not glad that uh, uh, I was right uh, last year. I would be much happier if we can celebrate uh, uh, Ukrainian success uh, and restoration of full control uh, over your territory. But um, my uh, intention last year was uh, not to ruin uh, uh, combat uh, spirit of Ukrainian forces, uh, but rather stress uh, that uh, we all should strive for the best, but be ready for the worst and uh, also count with uh, other options and be ready how do we react on them. Since last year, the situation on the battlefield has changed significantly. Uh, now uh, we see that the situation is, uh, is not good uh, in a number of areas. Uh, Russia, despite all of the mistakes uh, uh, on their side from the beginning of uh, uh, the aggression, has uh, learned a lot of lessons, uh, including uh, from uh, Ukrainian military and their tactics. Uh, they uh, managed uh, to uh, transit uh, to uh, war economy. They are now producing more uh, weapons and ammunition that uh, we collectively uh, can uh, provide uh, to Ukraine. Uh, they don't care about their human resources, uh, so uh, their uh, pool uh, for mobilization is still much, much larger than on the Ukrainian side. And uh, uh, also, uh, President Putin uh, is now uh, working uh, with the direction uh, to uh, achieve some success, visible success, prior to uh, the elections. So. Uh, what uh, we can do with this um, situation, uh, realizing uh, the facts, uh, is uh, to support uh, Ukraine in uh, deliveries of weapons and ammunition from all the sources available. And I think we should be as innovative, as flexible as uh, our Ukrainian soldiers on the, on the ground and uh, start looking for an equipment uh, everywhere. 
Uh, and uh, I would use an example of my own country uh, where uh, we took an approach uh, uh, that uh, we are looking for ammunition uh, and equipment uh, all around the world and then uh, work with our partners uh, in, in NATO. I would like to mention specifically uh, Denmark, Netherlands, Canada, with whom uh, we have come up with the arrangement uh, that we combine uh, uh, know-how with resources. We uh, get that equipment uh, from third countries, deliver it uh, to either our country for overhaul and then, uh, then uh, speed it uh, and deliver it to Ukraine. Uh, we have identified at this point half a million rounds of uh, 155 caliber, another 300,000 rounds uh, of 122 caliber, which uh, we will be able to deliver within weeks if uh, we find quickly uh, funding for that um, activity. And we will uh, address our partners from uh, US, Germany, uh, Sweden, uh, and uh, we look also around uh, for whoever is uh, able to uh, uh, contribute to the, uh, this effort. The aim of this activity is uh, uh, to strengthen at maximum Ukrainian defense so that they uh, spare their uh, human resources, they cause uh, as much attrition to Russian forces as possible, and uh, that uh, they hold the ground they, they have uh, right now. Uh, not to allow Russia to develop any, uh, any significant success. Because as we know, this war uh, is uh, as much about uh, real war fighting on the battlefield uh, as it is about uh, uh, psychological warfare. And President Putin desperately needs uh, to uh, interpret uh, uh, the activities of uh, Russia and Ukraine as a success. We shouldn't uh, leave him the space for it. First, uh, uh, allowing Ukraine to hold the territory, and second, to uh, go on with our efforts uh, to uh, uh, integrate Ukraine into both EU and NATO, stressing clearly uh, that uh, a temporary occupation of part of Ukrainian territory is not a stop for us uh, on the way towards EU and NATO. That would uh, not only give uh, Ukraine clear indication that we mean it seriously, but it would also give a clear indication uh, to uh, President Putin that uh, he will not succeed. Thank you. Just one, one quick follow-up on that. Um, the, the idea that you lay out, do you think that this should be happening now, even before any decision has been made in the US about whether you know, there will or will not be supplemental funding? And why isn't Europe doing what you're suggesting right now? I believe that uh, Europe is, uh, is, is doing a lot. Uh, it's not that uh, uh, European contribution uh, is, is small or negligent. Uh, I believe that uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, wait uh, for the United States. Uh, we all have to act uh, now. Uh, the sooner the better. And of course, uh, if uh, the bill in the United States is passed, uh, it, uh, it, will be, it will be obviously good news. But uh, if, if there is any delay, uh, we shouldn't wait. Uh, we, uh, we should do our best uh, right now. Thank you. Prime Minister Kalas, you have um, loudly, effectively and admirably for a long time been telling the world about the threat from Vladimir Putin. Um, do you feel that right now there is any change in the perception of that threat from your fellow politicians in the rest of the EU? Um, is there a sense that something is moving here about Europeans' own sense of their security? Yes, that is true. I think the first change was on the 24th of February in 2022. Uh, so so uh, this is, uh, there is some movement, of course, we would like to see it faster. But I would disagree with you that we, last year we were all up I think the war was still going on and we weren't upbeat, but I agree with you that maybe we were overly optimistic uh, regarding the counteroffensive in 2023. What we should avoid is being overly pessimistic in 2024. I think, you know, if, if we let, you know, our... Um, emotions down, then we can't accomplish anything. I think this is also very, very important. Uh, so what, what have we done? Uh, I mean, uh, we have ramped up still the uh, 
defense expenditure, but we also have ramped up the defense production. I mean, I just met with uh, one of the representatives of defense industry who said that we have increased ammunition production by 10 times. So there is movement. And of course, there are different, uh, you know, signals coming from different uh, European countries about, uh, you know, factories being built and, and so that we could deliver what we promised uh, to Ukraine and do it faster. Uh, I totally agree with uh, President Zelensky who just said that uh, don't do something, do everything uh, that is needed uh, in order for uh, Ukraine to defend uh, itself. Because as I said before, I mean, we have seen this before. I mean, let's not repeat the mistakes we, we did in history. I mean, history rhymes, but we also have um, the possibility to change that. Um, Prime Minister Fredrickson, I was going to ask you a somewhat similar question, and I'm not going completely in order here. Is your sense that uh, there is I mean, there is clearly a willingness within Europe, and a sense, but but I often hear we can't substitute for the Americans in the short term. We can't. We we will step up, but but there's a limit to what we can do. Do you do you share that? Are you I, do you think Europe is doing as much as it could be doing? Well, that was clear. Yeah. Um, no, but of, of, of course, that it has to be the answer. Uh, not meaning that we haven't done a lot during the last two years, because we have. And we can be quite proud uh, of our transatlantic community, because it has never been stronger than it is today. But I think it's quite clear to all of us that it is not enough. So we have to speed up and we have to scale up. And no matter what will happen in the US, the conclusion has to be written already now, as Europeans. We have to be able to protect ourselves. And pr to protect ourselves, we need to deliver what is needed in Ukraine now. I, I think we all enjoy uh, this conference and, and, and to meet each other, but the sense of urgency is simply not clear enough uh, in, in, in our discussions. And uh, I think it's important, of course, to address the long-term perspective Totally uh, agree with you, Kaya, on, on European production. I was here in Germany just a few days ago to, to open up an am, am, ammunition um, factory together with the German Chancellor, and we have to do much more. But if you ask the Ukraines, they are asking us for ammunition now. Artillery now. Uh, from, from the Danish side, we, we decided to donate our entire artillery and, and, and I'm sorry to say, friends, there are still ammunition in stock in Europe. This is not only a question about production, because we have weapons, we have ammunition, uh, we have air defense that we don't have to use ourselves at the moment, that we should deliver to U Ukraine. So, yes. <laughs> so, uh, as Kaya said, we need not to be pessimistic because we have to solve this situation. But, but Russia, Russia do not want peace with us. They are destabilizing the Western world from many different angles. In the Arctic region, in Balkan, in Africa, with disinformation, with cyber attacks, with hybrid war, and obviously in Ukraine. So if they don't want peace, <laughs> We have to be able to defend ourselves. Of course, the best thing is in our transatlantic community. And uh, our alliance is now 75 years old. It has been the strongest alliance the world has ever seen. But no matter what will happen in the US, the responsibility for Europe has to be in Europe. And we have to do more. Prime Minister Denkov um, and Secretary Clinton, I am going to come to you, but I thought we'd have all the views, and you, Prime Minister, too, but we'd have all the views from Europe first. So the view from Bulgaria, you have, uh, you know, you know the Russians well. Um, you have, you are geographically and uh, historically, you have a sense of this. Uh, do you think your colleagues uh, in Western Europe, in the European Union, understand or have a sense of the gravity of this and the urgency of it? Do you agree with, with Prime Minister Fredrickson? You're right that we are close to the battlefield. We have this historical and cultural ties to understand maybe better what is happening there. 
And this is probably one of the reasons we reacted in the first days of the war. So we were one of the first countries to send AMUs to say, okay, we have to support you on the ground with whatever we have. And we send already three packages. We are discussing what else we can do with the support of the other countries as well. But what we see is that this sense of urgency was not shared first by the other politicians. So it took some time. Maybe the over-optimism that you mentioned last year in some way kept the understanding of the politicians that it is urgent. It has not changed from the first days of the war. It is always urgent. But what worries me a little bit more is that the politicians started to understand this. You still have not conveyed this message sufficiently to the people in our countries. So this is one of the missions that I have, I feel, in my, in my country to explain to the people that this historical ties doesn't help us in this situation because the danger is there and we have to open our eyes. We should not stay with uh, widely uh, closed eyes, just the opposite. We have to open the, the eyes of every citizen in, in Europe to understand that the life that we enjoy, the life that we want to be safe, can disappear as it happened many times in history. And then we can win the opinion of the people and then they will support us. This is still missing today. And this one sense of urgency that I have. Um, thank you. Prime Minister de Croo, I want to ask you about frozen assets. But just first, before that, as, as um, Prime Minister Denkov said, do you think the sense is still amongst, let's, let's take your own country, uh, voters that it is about helping Ukraine or do they understand that it is about helping themselves? Well, if you see what happened to, um, to Alexei Navalny, I think it's quite clear who's in front of us. And unfortunately, his, his death is, um, is not a surprise, unfortunately. And, and we can only honor what he was fighting for, in fighting for democracy, against corruption. And he kept going back. He could have stayed here, but he kept going back. So we can only have incredible admiration for what, he, uh, for what he stood for, and it shows the Russia in front of us, um, which is a Russia that only has bad intentions with their own population and with us Europeans. Um, so yes, Ukraine is fighting for much more than just Ukraine. It's fighting for our Western way, uh, our Western way of life, and it's quite clear that in the next decades, we will have, as Europeans, a Russia confronted to us who is not friendly and who has only very bad intentions with, uh, with, with all their neighbors. So one of the means of combating this Russia is to seize its assets. And a large fraction of those assets sit in your country. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't you doing more to, as some countries say, uh, seize those assets. Why is this still the subject of loyally discussion and not action? Well, first of all, there is one country that is going to pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine. And it is Russia and only Russia. So Russia is going to pay for this. To do this, we'll have to do it on different tracks. One of them is the proceeds of those frozen assets. There, the European Commission has made a legal basis to, uh, to use them, and we already use the taxation on the, the proceeds of that going to, um, going to Ukraine. Then for the assets themselves, um, we need to build a legal basis that enables us to use or to leverage those hundreds of billions that are sitting there. The right level to do it is the G7, we are confident that finding a solution to leverage those assets, to quickly get access to the capital market, to bring the hundreds of billions to Ukraine, to reconstruct Ukraine, we're confident that it is possible to find a sound, a sound legal basis for it. We'll work together with the G7 to, uh, uh, to do it. But we Belgians cannot do it on our own. We will work together with the G7 to find a solution and to make sure that the billions can be used to reconstruct the ones who are suffering of the incredible aggression of Russia. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister Kallas, very, very briefly, because I'm then going to open the floor. 
Okay, you can't briefly. All right, well, then I would, I'd rather nothing than no briefly. <laughs> we'll come back. Secretary Clinton, you have uh, sat here listening to various European leaders um, talk about what they would do if the US didn't show up. Um, I guess I have two simple questions for you. One is, will this supplemental be passed and will the US show up? And two, can we in Europe still rely on the US? Well, first, um, let me say I think Europe should do what uh, the prime ministers uh, have said they intend to do regardless of what happens from the U.S. I think it's in Europe's interest, it's in Ukraine's interest, and it is in the United States' interest for uh, Europe to continue to uh, increase its support, increase its defense spending, increase its cooperation uh, in order to confront Russia and to be prepared uh, for what happens in Ukraine and beyond. But I do think that the United States will finally pass the supplemental. It will probably not happen until March. Um, there is, as you know, a minority of Republicans in the House who have been holding it up. If it gets a vote in the House, it will pass overwhelmingly on a bipartisan vote. So the challenge will be getting it to the floor, and there are a number of ways that can happen, but the new Speaker of the House uh, recessed the House until February 28th, so there will be no official business until that date and after. It is also, I think, clear uh, that the administration remains committed. About half of the Republicans in the Senate remain committed. Uh, so one way or another, we will uh, see additional funding. But I want to make a, a broader point, because I think what you've heard from the prime ministers uh, today is very historically important, and I want to underscore that. Um, part of it is a recognition of the threat to Ukraine being a threat to Europe, a threat to the transatlantic uh, alliance. But part of it is also a recognition that there has to be a commitment uh, by European uh, nations and the EU uh, to do more to defend themselves. And I would argue that if we look at Ukraine right now, we need to be looking at the battle space, the cyberspace, and the headspace. The battle space needs, as uh, Prime Minister Fredrickson said, more speed and scale. So finding those munitions wherever they can be found, stopping shipping to others in order to ship to Ukraine, looking for new production capacities, working with Ukraine to increase domestic capacity. All of that has to be done, and there also has to be a recognition that whatever reasons there were initially to withhold longer range artillery, and more air support is no longer in any way relevant to the battle space and to the future of this conflict and what it means for all of us. So whatever hesitancy there was, I think reality should have overcome it. And we need to do much more, much more quickly, and I certainly think that's true for the United States as well. Uh, and, you know, I see some people that uh, I had the privilege of working with uh, in uh, the Obama administration, like former General Petraeus here, and I think part of our message has to be to our own government, get more creative, get much more in the pipeline more quickly, because part of it is the delay between passing legislation and appropriation and actually getting things out the door. Cyberspace, there has begun to be a recognition that this is also a battlefield, and we need to be much more creative. The Ukrainians have been extraordinarily ingenious, but there needs to be much more help given to them. And the cyberspace is not just a military space, it is an influence space. And we see an extraordinary effort by the Russians, a successful effort, I believe, to influence minds to affect political decision-making, to make it difficult for leaders uh, in Bulgaria and elsewhere to really convince populations because they're getting so many other messages through social media and other sources about 
what Russia is really doing and meaning that runs counter to the warnings and the threats that we should be communicating. So that leaves the headspace. And I think it's absolutely important to be realistic and maybe to go from being too optimistic uh, to less optimistic, but not to in any way seed that headspace where we have to do a much better job of convincing ourselves, convincing our countries, our governments, that we have to stand with Ukraine and make sure that they do win. And it's going to be critical that we do that as in a series of ways, including not just government actions and rhetoric, but also being smarter about the influence side of this ongoing conflict. You know, I'll just end by saying, you know, Russia has been a master of active measures for a very long time. Their propaganda was uh, quite successful in recent years in a number of uh, arenas, uh, one of which I know very well. And I think it's important that we recognize we can't just assume that that is an area that they are going to dominate without giving them a fight. And we are not even in the same arena. They are influencing Africa, Asia, Latin America. Their message about what this war is about, who the aggressor is, what the consequences are, is going unanswered. And it's mostly being waged on social media. Finally, I just saw a an analysis of what's on TikTok. And remember, TikTok is easily influenced by the Chinese government. So they may not be providing as much physical material, but they're certainly providing intellectual influence. If you look at and analyze content on TikTok, it is about a 50 to one ratio, pro-Russia versus anti-Ukraine. Where are we? What are we doing? Why are we not engaged in that battle space, that cyberspace, that headspace? So I think, I think uh, European leaders have really stepped up. And uh, I think eventually the uh, American House of Representatives will as well. But, you know, we have a long struggle ahead of us. And the obvious point to make about Donald Trump is take him literally and seriously. He means what he says. People did not take him literally and seriously in 2016. Now he is telling us what he intends to do. And people who try to wish it away, brush it away, are living in an alternative uh, reality. He will do everything he can to become an absolute authoritarian leader if given the opportunity to do so. And he will pull us out of NATO even though the Congress passed a resolution saying that he couldn't without congressional support because he will just not fund our obligations. So we may be there, you know, in name only. So take it very seriously and uh, continue to do what Europe needs to do on its own. So that is a sobering, um, thank you. Thank you, Secretary. That is, that is a, that is a sobering point to turn uh, to you, Andrei Yamak, head of the Office of the President of Ukraine. Uh, two questions for you. The first is give us a sense of just how much pressure you are under for lack of ammunition. Give us a short-term sense of the stakes. And secondly, uh, perhaps you could tell me how you are planning, given what we've just heard from Secretary Clinton and given what the US polls tell us, which is if the election was today, it is fairly likely that President Trump would win. This is a very real probability that needs to be thought about. How do you think about it? It could happen in less than a year. First of all, works, works. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I'm very, uh, first of all, for me, big honor to be here now and uh, to see a lot of very big friends of Ukraine, uh, uh, who is uh, the great leaders and uh, the great people who support Ukraine and stand this Ukraine from the very beginning of this uh, unprovoked invasion from Russia. First of all, thank you very much for your support and help. 
Thank you for your questions. Uh, yes, it's a critically important uh, the time. I'm very optimistic about the decisions of the House and the continue for the support uh, of United States. But time, it's very critical. And you can see uh, what happened now in uh, Avdiivka. You can, you can see what happened in the all front line. Uh, our heroes stand it, our heroes' fightings. But it's impossible to do without enough ammunition, enough weapons, enough, enough uh, air defense. And this is a very important that everything will be in time. This is not the questions uh, uh, of uh, some just political issue. It's the questions of our surviving. It's the questions uh, of uh, our future victory. But I want to give some uh, optimistic uh, uh, and things because uh, the reality is following. I, I want uh, to ask you a little bit back two years ago to Munich. And I remember the feelings of the, of the people who is listening to our President Vladimir Zelensky here. First of all, a lot of people uh, recommended to him to not come and look and listen to him and probably not believe for 100% that uh, uh, it will be reality that we not give to Putin to occupy it, all the Ukraines, that we can show that we cannot just defend our lands, but we already liberated about 50% what was occupied from 24th of the uh, 2020. Um, I think Ukraine nations show that we're able to win this war. It's time to not just talking about possible, not possible. It's time to help us to win. About your second questions. You know, uh, very important, we know, uh, af because you know, the President Zelensky visited to uh, Washington in the, in the December of the last year before it was visit of uh, together with our speaker and uh, the first uh, Deputy Prime Minister. We back the, the feelings of the very strong bipartisan support. And what is a very much important that we feel how support by the American people. Because American people clearly understand that for what Williams we are fighting. And yesterday tragedy, the murder of the Alexei Navalny, maybe to open the eyes just for the some skeptical people in the world, what is it uh, Russia today? Who is Putin? And it's impossible, uh, you know, I will listen, especially during the meetings of the national security advisors of the peaceful formula of the President Zelensky, we are listening, uh, especially from global south country, why you're not sitting to the table with Russia, why you not negotiate? I think what happened yesterday, what happened two years ago, Maybe it's enough to think that this Russia, this Putin, it's possible to negotiate and to trust them. And I'm, I hope, I believe that uh, this support of American people uh, will be push some political, some uh, politics uh, who is uh, maybe uh, hesitate and not understand that this aid uh, for us, it's a very urgent and this is a very critical thing. Maybe, except that it is worth remembering what Secretary Clinton said, that Donald Trump should be taken seriously. And he has said that he would make peace in 24 hours, which everyone assumes, I think rightly, is peace at your expense. Do you not, you, you must be thinking about this. So how, how do you, this is, this is not a you know, tiny negligible prospect. 
you know, I repeat, I'd like to repeat the great answer uh, to the practically same uh, questions uh, uh, which our president received uh, uh, today in the morning. And he answered that if President uh, Tr if, uh, uh, Donald Trump decided uh, to come to Ukraine, I'm ready to go with him to the front line. And uh, he personally see what happened and uh, maybe it uh, uh, will give to him the real understanding because I'm absolutely sure the people who is personally and many of the leaders personally not one time visited to Ukraine during these uh, uh, two years. I don't know a person who personally visited and go to Kharkiv, go to Bucha, go to Odessa, back to the home and not be sure for 100% what it's necessary to support Ukraine, what it's possible to believe that Ukrainians are able to win this war. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I now turn to General Petraeus to you? Um, you spoke, I remember it vividly, two years ago uh, on this panel, and you said the question you had was, would Ukrainians fight? And that question has been very powerfully answered. Now, um, could you give us your assessment of what is at stake in the short term in terms of the weaponry crunch, what can be done if the supplemental is not passed? Uh, how pessimistic, optimistic are you on the battlefield in the next few months? Well, thanks very much, and uh, thanks, Victor, as always, for pulling us all together for the crucial issue of the day, frankly. And Madam Secretary, thanks for such a powerful a statement really on behalf of the country and really on behalf of reality. You can see, by the way, why I was so privileged to have her as a great supporter at the Situation Room table uh, when I was in uniform and then at the CIA. Um, look, I first want to say that when we think back to last year, I think, Victor, you characterized it beautifully where you said the first year we underestimated the Ukrainians, the second year we underestimated uh, the enemy. The truth is what we also underestimated was the slow pace of decisions. The optimism, if you will, last year was qualified. It was based on expectations that the U.S. decision on tanks, on longer range precision munitions, on improved conventional munitions, cluster munitions, on Western aircraft, all of these were, many more, by the way, were delayed far, far too long, MLRS at the beginning and so on. And it wasn't just that, again, there was an underestimation of the formidable Russian defenses and so forth, uh, it was that we didn't put in the hands of the Ukrainian soldiers what they really needed at the time that they most needed it. And we lost an opportunity as a result of that. So, Madam Secretary, when you say, you know, again, we should learn from this, there should not be this hesitation, this almost self-deterrence that we have experienced over the years. This is a really important moment. Um, Look, if this doesn't come through, uh, I just did a piece for foreign policy, actually, and they, they asked me, what do you see for what lies ahead in Ukraine? And the title of the piece is, It Depends. It depends, most importantly, obviously, on how quickly and how much the U.S. provides to Ukraine. That is the what hangs over all of this. It depends on how the European leaders in their countries do what has been described up here. My old military colleague, now president, I think captured that beautifully. Um, it also depends, frankly, though, you know, Andre, on the ability of Ukraine to generate additional forces. We all know in the RADA there's a very, very difficult decision that has to be taken uh, on whether or not this conscription age will be lowered, how you'll be able to generate forces, and of course, keeping in mind that the enemy has three times the population of Ukraine in an economy that's probably ten times. So, and we can list a number of others. It depends on the pace of technology acquisition not just what we give Ukraine, but what Ukraine does. By the way, we should not overlook the enormous success of the past six or eight months that has taken place in the Black Sea. Who's achieved that? The Ukrainians did this. It is their maritime drones that have done this. The, the port of Sevastopol in occupied Crimea has had a Russian Black Sea fleet for centuries. The bulk of it is no longer there. It's been forced to withdraw 
by what the Ukrainians have done there and then also what they've done at sea. Some of the stuff at sea has been helped by countries providing longer range uh, merit anti-ship missiles and so forth, but a lot of it is again produced by Ukraine. So that's another huge factor. And when you said, Madam Secretary, we should be providing to Ukraine everything we can in that regard, uh, to help them with the incredible engineering, IT skills, weapons manufacturing, and so forth, that's another crucial element. So I think, you know, I used to be asked when I was commanding the surge in Iraq, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I would say I'm neither. I am a realist, and the reality is that it's all hard all the time, but hard is not hopeless. And I think that actually characterizes the situation right now, but it depends. Thank you. I have a long list of um, eminent uh, Western politicians who would like to speak, and you will all get to speak, but I think at this moment I would like to hear some Ukrainian heroes speak. Um, and I'd like to hear from you what it is that you need and the urgency with which you need it. And maybe we could start with Alexander Batalov, who is a gunner medic from the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Is he here? Oh, you need to put your headsets on for this. Yes, my name is Alexander Batalov. I'm the soldier of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. In the civil life, I was doing massage. Um, uh, um, I was working. I was um, very happy for my country and my family. I was traveling a lot. When uh, the war came, I joined the Armed Forces, and until now, I'm in the Army, and I'm fighting um, and defending our country a bit on a different front now. I received trauma in Bakhmut. We we were trying to clean up the little forest where our enemy was. During that assault, we were covered by the Russian enemy artillery, and I was wounded. Six and a half hours I was in the battlefield, but they couldn't evacuate me because uh, the vehicles couldn't come there because our enemies adjust very well when they see us. They um, start hitting us very hard, and they don't allow us even to take our wounded from the field. But six and a half hours is a lot for an ordinary people person just to lie there. But with the wound, that's almost unrealistic. But the only thought that kept me alive and conscious at that time was my wife that I saw in my eyes. Uh, in in my uh, in my thoughts, and I felt that she was waiting for me, and that's how every family and every wife and every mother and sister uh, uh, is waiting for our soldiers. So we know what we are fighting for. We are fighting for the freedom of our country, for the freedom of our uh, wives, uh, brothers and sisters and children, for us to be free, breathe freely, walk freely like we do here in Munich. We were walking here on the streets a little bit, and we want to bring this spirit of freedom back. When you don't, uh, you, you, don't you don't think about the air raid alerts and that you have to go to the shelter because something can fly in. So because of your support, because of your weaponry, we'll be able to do it faster. We'll be able to do so that your children, your soldiers do not suffer as we do, so that we wouldn't have to buy expensive artificial limbs and walk on them the rest of our lives. By helping us us, but with your contemporary weapons, you are making the step towards a peaceful life in your countries, towards the peaceful uh, journeys and traveling and peaceful sleep in your country. So if you get in on a global level and you, if you give it all the need, needed resources and you uh, will help us to make a big, strong blow, we will make it. And you will be breathing freely in our respective territories. Slava Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could, could we now also hear from Khlip Strishko, the head of the Veterans Hub in Kiev? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Khlip. My last name is Trishko. I'm the Marine. Right now, I'm also a veteran. It has happened so when the war started in my country in 2014, I was back at school. I was graduating from grade 11. At that time, I was simply actively participating in the revolution of dignity in Maidan. And for me, this was something 
um, un unfathomable. And when the annexation of Crimea started in, in February, then anti-terrorist uh, organization started. My senior, my, my elder brother, who was a, a, a soldier, he went to the front line. My father, we have uh, many children in the family, he had the right not to serve at first. He was de denied mobilization, but he wrote the letter to the ministry of Minister of Defense, and he was allowed, based on his constitutional rights, to go to the army. And starting from 2014, was close to the war, because, but because I was only 17, I couldn't join the armed forces. So I was uh, studying in the university. My brother kept saying that he gives me the opportunity to study, and that, for me, was extremely valuable. And as time go went by, after graduation, I started working in the Ukrainian Academy of Leadership with Ukrainian youth, and I was working in the city of Mykolaiv at that time that had the largest uh, military presence at that time. I had lots of uh, uh, aviation coming from Crimea, lots of Marines, um, and I was um, happy with the motto, Sample Fidelis, which says, always uh, true, always. And I thought that uh, I wanted to join them. On the 21st, um, uh, 2021st, I've signed the contract, and the one year before uh, the full-fledged war, I was sworn in, and I was a dreamer, because at the age of 25, I got my biggest goal, my biggest value of serving Ukraine, the possibility to fight for Ukraine with arms in my hands. Because I think many of you have heard the slogan, Ukraine above all, and it just happened so that for me it's not just the slogan but the way of life. And in the beginning of the full-fledged war, for three months I was already in the United Armed Forces near the city of Mariupol and there in the trenches to the north of Mariupol I met uh, the first days of the full-fledged war and I understood at that time that I'm not going to call my relatives because I, we were told to switch off the telephones. I understood that my elder brother my father are fighting as well, and uh, it, it's not time to be bothered with me, and I didn't have time to uh, be bothered with them. So I had six soldiers that I had in charge of, six Marines, and I had one agenda, war agenda, in front of me. Then after two weeks, for the first time, I called my brother, and I heard probably the most valuable words from him, that, that he is proud not only of me as a brother, Rather, but also as a soldier, and I laughed, and after that uh, we got disconnected. Uh, in the beginning of April, when uh, the siege was uh, almost locked, the, uh, and more and more Russians uh, attacked, I, I was wounded, I remember even now, the building where I was, the aviation bomb flew in, and I also flew out of the third floor, and I was then buried by all these uh, rubbles, and I thought that I would die there in my 25 years of age, not in some epic battle, but there, and then I got dug out by my friends, uh, um, my pelvis was completely destroyed, my jaw was uh, broken, my nose was broken, my ballistic eyes were glued into my eyes, I didn't see anything, only the helmet saved my head because it cracked. And in that condition, my soldiers took me out, they gave me the first aid, and they brought me to the basement on the neighboring building, and in the corner of that building also another bomb hit, and part of it fell down, and two of my comrades were under rebels, and then my combat medic said, this is the second uh, bomb in 10 minutes, so you'll have to survive, then it means. And this is what I kept reminding myself when I was in Mariupol. And then later, after I got wounded, just to keep me alive, I was given to to uh, the, as a prisoner of war. To, uh, to, to, and for 17 days, I wasn't assisted at all. They, I was transported from the by, through the occupied cities in Donetsk, Oblast, then to Taganrog, then uh, by plane to the occupied uh, Crimea in captivity. 
And after I was exchanged, I continued dreaming because the dream about my life came true. I started dreaming about learning to walk because I wasn't given any forecasts that I will walk once again. And the fact that I'm standing is already a miracle. In my pelvis, we have two tight tenon uh, rods that help me to walk. In my jaws, I have a lot of tight and, and, and metal. I just wear brackets just to keep my teeth. I don't even see the end of this hole because I look with my one eye because Russians were not helping me with the second eye. But I keep dreaming and I dream about the good, honest and calm life in Ukraine. And right now for this dream, I have a dog. I have a girlfriend, she's also a soldier and she wished me all the best when I will say this because I always dream to, for the war to ultimately finish and for me just to have a dog, to have a girlfriend who will become my wife, we will have children, we will have a house and I will be able to live calmly without reacting to the air raid alarms. And in this hall we have a lot of dreamers too and I want you to help us to make these dreams come true because my foreign minister Dmitro Kuleba recently said that it is time to be pacifist and there are times to be pacifist with arms and I want to be a pacifist and a dreamer with arms so please help me to make my dream come true thank you thank you and I'd, I'd like to hear from one more Yulia Payevska I will speak Ukrainian. My English is not perfect enough, so I would not want to torture you. Gleb told about his dog. I think of myself as a dog often. I understand everything, but I can say very limited thoughts. Everyone you see in this room we are the dogs of war. You see us in uniform as dogs of war. These recent years we dedicated to defend our land. My brothers in arms are uh, moving out of Avdiivka right now, but some are left there forever. Many, many brothers and sisters in arms over these 10 years of war that I've been fighting. I started Maidan. I'm a, a medic at Maidan. Then I was teaching tactical medicine and I stayed at the front because I understood that's where I need to provide my best help. And then since that time until I was captured in Mariupol, I was at the front. I started um, uh, battalion of medics, angels. I also was uh, the chief medic at uh, Mariupol military hospital that is now occupied by Russians. I was there uh, uh, when Mariupol was uh, sieged. I uh, see. I saw this city, formerly home, uh, to oh, half a million, um, destroyed by 90 percent. I uh, see high rises with graves of children in the courtyards, mothers bearing their babies. Imagine. I had children die in my hands, civilians, elderly. I, I don't know how you can forgive that. Thousands of soldiers have gone through my hands. Thousands of civilians, streams of blood, the rivers of suffering. I can only try to explain things that I feel, but words do not help. We're the dogs of war. We 
made commitment to our people. We swore the oath and we fight. This is a great honor. Only war I understood what is the highest value to give up your life, to dedicate your life to something that you love the most. I love my nation. I pray that none of you and that your children would not be forced to defend your own land. Just because Russians would decide that they have right to your land. I was in captivity for three months. I don't know how I could tell you about that. I'm here before you. It's two, uh, two years, almost two years since my captivity. I had six surgeries after the captivity. Three very serious, three just normal ones. I will survive. Six surgeries. There is not an injured point in my body, okay? But that's not about me. It's about those who remain in captivity for two years, being tortured every day, being beaten every day. That humiliation. I don't know what uh, torture is worse, physical or psychological. God forbid for you to experience that. War, you know, it's, uh, uh, it drinks our blood. It's never satisfied with our blood. It's always hungry. Uh, the more you give, the more she wants. We need to stop that. To stop the war, we need to kill the war. Give us weapons to murder the war. We will manage. Just help us a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for your heroism, and thank you for reminding us in the most powerful way of what is at stake here. It is going to be hard for anybody to speak after this. But I think it is time, perhaps, to get a sense of historical perspective before we go back to the politicians of today. So briefly, we have two eminent historians here. You know them both well. Maybe, Timothy Snyder, I could start with you, and you could try and give us some, some context to make sense of just what we've heard and where you see where we are now, two years in, um, and, and put, put the stakes and put the, the fight that Ukraine is involved in into that broader context. I'll try. The first thing I want to say is that we have to do our part to connect to the people on the ground. This is a very strange war in which the people of only one country are doing the fighting. This is a war with international implications, not just for Europe and North America, but for Asia. It's in many ways a world war, but it's a world war in which only one country is doing the resisting. 
in a strange way, because they've resisted so well, they're alone. They've lasted so long, and therefore they're alone. When you ask for a historical comparison, I think of 1938 or 1939. Poland held off the Wehrmacht for a while, longer than people remember at great losses, but it was a matter of weeks, not years, and so others had to come in. Because the Ukrainians have resisted so well, no one else has had to fight yet. And so I don't think we appreciate how much they are doing for us and that therefore our duty has to be to bring the things to them that they need. It's shocking, given our economic preponderance, and this is my second point, how slowly we have mobilized that. It's a mistake of the 21st century to think that economic preponderance automatically leads to some kind of victory. You have to find creatively the ways to move that economical preponderance onto the battlefield. And we have not been creative enough about that, and we have not been quick enough about that. If we compare what we have done, with all due respect to the leaders of my own country and European friends, if we compare it to all the improvisations, all of the workarounds that Roosevelt found or Churchill found, we're not up to that standard. And, and that's the standard that we have to hold ourselves up to. The next point that I want to make, which I think is very important, is this idea of Duch Svobodi, that the spirit of freedom, that this is all one struggle. When Secretary Clinton speaks of, of, of cyber war, this is an example of how what the Ukrainians are doing is part of one struggle, which affects all of us. They're just doing 10,000 times more than everyone else, but it's nevertheless one struggle. We can't do without the category of victory, right? Last thing. Secretary Clinton used the word victory. Mr. Yermak talked about winning. You don't always win wars, but you never win them unless you set victory as the goal. We have to set victory as the goal. In 2024, the Europeans have to help the, European, help, help the Ukrainians hold the line with or without the Americans. I'm optimistic about March, I'm optimistic about November, but with or without the Americans, the word that we all have to use is victory. If we don't set that as the goal, it's not clear what we have to do in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neil Ferguson, and then after that, Anne Applebaum. Neil, you have, you have looked at the grand sweep of many conflicts. Put, this, put your perspective on this. Well, <clears throat> Zanny and everybody, Victor, the challenge is to convince certain people and politicians that this is as dire a need as Yulia just described. And that is a challenge. Think of the least recent polling from the United States, which shows that only a small and dwindling minority of Republican voters think the United States is not doing enough. Uh, there's still a significant number who think it's doing enough, and then there is a proportion that think it's doing too much. But it's not only Americans. Sometimes one comes to the Munich Security Conference and feels as if it's all America's fault. It's also Germans. How do you persuade German voters and politicians that a debt break makes any sense at all when the defense budget is less than 2% of gross domestic product, which as my good friends at the uh, Kiel Institute show is historically a ludicrously low percentage. It's lower than was imposed on Germany under the Treaty of Versailles, for God's sake. The arguments against increased defense spending in Europe are laughable. They're laughable economically. Because defense spending is insurance. Defense spending is investment. It's not consumption. Germany could have a world-class defense industry and a world-class army if it chose to. And I would have thought the imperative is rather more compelling than for voters in the swing states of the United States, given the proximity of this conflict. So how do we do that? 
Yuli, I, your speech was the most moving thing I've heard at a conference in many years. I shall remember we are the dogs of war tonight and for many years to come. How do we get your message to those people, those voters and those politicians who pander to their laziness? I think there are two ways. The first is to say, this is indeed, as Tim Snyder rightly says, a world war already. It's not just a little war here, a little war there. These wars are connected. Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea are a true axis today, cooperating, colluding to undermine the Western international order, what used to be the Pax Americana. And they're doing it with increasing effectiveness. And there will be other theaters of war. There already is a theater of war in the Middle East, with the prospect that that will escalate too. Before long, there will be a theater of war in the Far East. That seems almost inevitable. So we must persuade those Republican voters, those free Democrats, this is a world war and it affects you. One way or another, it comes to you. The dogs of war will not remain in Ukraine. They will not be confined to Israel. And the last thing I'll say is, we must help our people imagine those dogs of war. What I see around me in the United States and in Europe, in Germany, is a colossal failure of imagination. It's as if we just can't imagine it happening to us. We just can't picture it. As if it never happened to Munich. As if bombs never rained down on London. As if American boys were not the dogs of war in the 1940s in the 1950s in Korea, in the 1960s in Indochina. Why can't we imagine this? I recommend greater imagination. Let us all try, when we go home, wherever our homes are, to make Yulia's dogs of war seem visible to voters, visible to politicians, because these dogs of war are, I'm afraid, dogs of world war. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, one, one person who has done a huge amount to help us with that imagination, to lay out the threat posed by Vladimir Putin in, in brilliant prose, both in her books and in her articles, is Anne Applebaum. And the floor is now yours, because you have on so much of this been proved so right. Th thank you so much, and let me just first say that I wish I wasn't right, so th um, thank thanks for that. Um, it, let me make two points. One is to echo what Neil just said and what others have said, that it's incorrect right now to think of what we're doing now as fighting a Cold War. You know, this is, there isn't one block on one side and one block on the other side. What we are fighting is a connected group of autocracies who cooperate when it suits them, not always, who have not necessarily anything in common ideologically. So nationalist Russia and communist China and Bolivarian Venezuela and, you know, and, 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 and Cuba and Iran, theocratic Iran, would not agree about many things. The one thing they agree about is that they don't like us. They don't like the people in this room. They don't like liberal democracies. They don't like uh, the, 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 the rule of law that uh, President Zelensky spoke about this morning. This is what they need to destroy. They need to destroy it firstly in their own countries. So you saw the death of Alexei Navalny is one of many um, you know, uh, you know w one, of, one, of, one of many crimes that the Russian president has committed to stay in power. 
Uh, and increasingly, they don't like it anywhere else because the existence of Navalny's people and Navalny's friends and Navalny's organizations and people who've been influenced by Navalny in other countries can be, be beamed back into Russia. So they now understand their concept of the world war is that they are fighting the same set of ideas at home and abroad. Sometimes it's an ideological conflict, as, as, pres as <laughs> I just almost said President Clinton. Excuse me. The, the person who should have been President Clinton, um, as Secretary Clinton has just said, sometimes it, they, they, they fight ideologically, sometimes they fight economically, sometimes they fight militarily. Um, but it's the, same, it's the same kind of fight. So that's, that's the first point. The second point is we need to be thinking in the same way. Look, this war is over when Russia leaves. And it doesn't really matter how Russia leaves or why they leave. They leave because they lose on the battlefield. They leave because their economy has crashed. They leave because we've shut down their electricity grid. I'm just making that up. But, you know, there's a, there, there, and we are not being sufficiently creative about thinking, uh, about fighting them in all the different ways that they fight us. So cyber, information, um, you know, s sanctions, you know, in a way sanctions, we've sanctioned lots of things, but we've pursued very few of those sanctions. We haven't tracked down the trucks that go across the Polish or Lithuanian border into Russia, supposedly going to Kazakhstan. Um, we haven't, we, we, we still aren't treating this war against Russia as if it were our war. If it were our war, all, you know, it wouldn't be six guys at the Treasury in the United States who are running the sanctions policy. It would be a team of a thousand people at the Pentagon. So that's the way we need to think, and that's how we can win. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you've heard now from, from all of the recent speakers about the failure of imagination and the failure of a sense of scale that, in Anne's words, this is our war. I wanted now to turn, in the last few minutes, we have three foreign ministers here, and then I'm going to come back to the panel. Um, but firstly, uh, Foreign Minister Tobias Bilstrom, where are you, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden? Uh, what are you going to do to answer the challenge that our eminent historians have just uh, laid out? Well, thank you very much for uh, raising the bar so high that I hardly could jump over it in those few minutes that have been uh, allowed to me. I will just start by saying thank you to all the ones who have taken the floor before me, most notably the people from Ukraine, who we follow your struggle every day. I would just like to say very briefly the following. As everybody has said, the ramifications of Russia's war on Ukraine, well, they reverberate globally. They impact economies, trade, the livelihoods of millions, and also the, the, the exacerbating food insecurity, which is also something we should talk about. And I think that when we look at this, with every passing day, Russia's atrocities and destruction of Ukraine continues. And the Kremlin consistently, as has been said by many, is trying to gain the upper hand through its larger population, its industrial capacity, its disregard for human suffering. And this strategy could succeed, as many have said and talked about, if the Western support were to decrease. So our response must continue to be strong, determined, making sure that the Russian defeat is the only possible end game in this. And together with our transatlantic partners, NATO, the global allies, we have stood united in our support for Ukraine. And this unity is the key to help Ukraine beat back the aggressor. Uh, now, I'm not going to go through all the things I have been given by my excellent staff. I'm just going to be very brief about this. We are joining NATO. Sweden is doing that. Hopefully, in just a few weeks' time. We're making the largest shift, the greatest shift for 200 years, leaving behind the history of being a non-military aligned country. And we are doing this exactly for the reason, Neil, which you are talking about, Namely, that we understand what could happen if we don't increase our security and our safety. And what's going on in Ukraine is a clear message to all of us that we need to take security firsthand. We have to put it above all other priorities. And that means doing all that the panel spoke about, increasing the production of ammunition, but more importantly, giving 
Ukraine what we already have. That is the most important thing at hand right now, and that is a call to all of us in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Espen Eide, Foreign Minister of Norway, very briefly. He's right there. Do we need a microphone for the... Uh, it's, behind, it's on your left. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'll be very quick because I know we're almost out of time. But first, thank you to all the speakers and particularly uh, my tribute to all the Ukrainians here. Uh, it's your cause, but it's also our cause. And we have been communicating very consistently that your battle is our battle and, and, and your victory is our victory. And if you, there wasn't the victory, it's also our very strategic, severe problem, which is why we want you to succeed. Uh, what Norway has done is to come up early with one of the largest long-term program, the Nansen program, and I'm very happy to see that this is now being, you know, it influenced also other countries. Denmark is doing something very similar. The EU now come up with a long-term plan, and I think what was particularly important is not only that it's a lot of money that is flexible and that is military and civilian, but, all, but the fact that it is, has been adapted for five years. So Ukraine knows that this will continue, come what may. And I think it's important to understand the importance today of this long-term commitment. But we also have learned on the way that we need to do better today, and none of us are doing enough. And I think I just want to add my voice to all those saying that we have to ramp up artillery production. We have to recognize that although Ukraine now has better equipment, better weapon, better intelligence support and uh, much higher morale, Russia is, has an advantage of volume, sort of more people Worse training, but more people, not so advanced equipment, but more of it. And we need to do something to compensate uh, of that right now. And this is very much a message coming out of this meeting, that the practical thing we have to do is to be able to produce more weapons, more munitions simultaneously. Because so far, if you add another billion and say, uh, please get me ammunition, it, they will put it after the current production in, 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 in the production train. And that has to be changed. So that's my message number one. And the other one is that that commitment is not only to Ukraine until they win the war, but also be beyond that, because we also have to prepare now for helping Ukraine, an independent, sovereign, free, democratic Ukraine, to become a true member of our Western uh, Euro-Atlantic structures, so that they will not only prevail in war, but also prevail in peace. And this is a call to everyone here, and we need to do more. None of us, we are doing a lot, but we need to do more. And we all have to inspire each other to really understand that the cause of these fantastic men and women that we've heard is also our cause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the last word before I go back to the panel, uh, Radek Sikorsky, you, you also have... Uh, loudly made the case for a long time. Uh, you have warned of the dangers of Vladimir Putin. You have been to the front many times. Uh, you are now foreign minister. Give us a sense of how you would respond to Neil Ferguson's challenge that, you know, we just haven't had the imagination yet. What needs to happen? What concretely, and then I'm going to come back to leave a challenge here for your heads of state um, and, and leaders. What do you want to see concretely now to really change things? You need a mic, yes. A mic for Foreign Minister Sikorsky. Um, I don't think it's a problem in my part of the world. We've been warning about this for years. And when I talk to colleagues from um, uh, the Polish government and uh, government on, governments on the uh, eastern and northern flanks, we all are keenly aware that we may be in 1938 or 39 and that we are facing the same dilemmas and uh, challenges that our ancestors did, and, that, and we, we will not fail. Um, I just have two arguments to make. First of all, in Western Europe, we need to persuade um, populations and elites that, that the, the deterring Putin after he's conquered Ukraine will be much more expensive than helping Ukraine now. It's a no-brainer. Because Putin will do to all of Ukraine what he did to Donbass. He will marshal the human and industrial resources to go further. He will draft Ukrainians into his army to attack us. 
That's, that's a terrible prospect. And my other proposition is this, and I'll speak uh, with my customary frankness, um, a message to our American friends. Um, we are very grateful to what the United States has done so far, but we are on a knife edge. Because Europe, even with all the financial resources that we've given, and they're actually bigger than the US, is not at the moment capable of producing all the equipment and ammo that is necessary. We cannot do this with the United States. And if the United States doesn't pass this package, Ukraine will be in real difficulty. But the United States will then be seen as an unreliable ally. In other words, they encourage you to fight. And then, because of some parochial concerns of somebody you previously never heard of, they don't come through. That will have consequences for America's alliances all around the world. Countries will start hedging. And this will affect American interests in ways that, are, that, that you can't even predict. And therefore, I think it's really, really important for the US to pass this package. Thank you. Thank you. One, one person who put this very starkly just recently was Trotslund Poulsen, the acting minister of defense of Denmark. Where are you, minister? Uh, and you said, uh, and I'm going to quote you, it cannot be ruled out that within a three to five year period, Russia will test Article 5. That was not the assessment of 2023. So um, I, I'm, I would like to acknowledge you, acknowledge the clarity with which you said that. And I'm now going to turn, if you don't mind, to the panel, because we're massively running out of time. But that challenge that the defense minister laid out, the challenge that uh, Foreign Minister Sikorsky has given, you've heard a remarkably moving uh, set of testimonies from our Ukrainian heroes. What, what do you take away from this? Y you were very sober last year. I mean, what more? And you said concrete things that needed to be done. Just leave us with what you're going to take away from this and what you're going to push your fellow European heads of state to do. Very short, sure, because all important has been already said. We heard a number of uh, moving uh, stories of Ukrainian soldiers, and uh, every day of delay will increase the number of these stories, including those uh, who will lose their beloved. I think we should really do uh, all uh, what is uh, at our disposal, uh, looking uh, in a very innovative and flexible way on all options to provide what Ukraine needs. Uh, they are suffering. Uh, the only thing that uh, we can sacrifice is a reduction of our own comfort. Let's do it. Thank you. Prime Minister Kalas. I think uh, it is important uh, that we think about the out-of-the-box solutions and we really have to concentrate our efforts. I mean, military support to Ukraine, political pressure on all the, uh, all the levels that we have in different in international institutions, uh, also economical pressure by uh, implementing the sanctions properly and, and putting really uh, end to the circumvention of sanctions. I think all these elements together and, and especially the out-of-the-box solutions that the Russians are afraid of, using the frozen assets, I mean, they are afraid of that. And, and uh, as I said, I can't be brief uh, arguing uh, you know uh, with um, with what uh, Alexander said about you know uh, how we can use not only the profits of the frozen assets but the frozen assets entirely but that's another topic but what I want to emphasize is that that we just I mean what I uh, I'm doing. I'm thinking of these uh, about these out of box solutions all the time that could actually make and bring the breaking point of this war uh, closer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister Dukru. Are you? I'm going to ask you a tough question to conclude, but I, and I don't mean it personally. But when when we are all looking back at this, and you particularly, given your role now, are you confident that you will be comfortable that you? Uh, and your fellow European Prime Ministers did as much as you possibly could have done? I think the unity we've shown is way more than anyone would have expected and way more than Vladimir Putin expected. Did Vladimir Putin expect that Finland and Sweden would join NATO? I don't think he expected that. Did he expect that we would give a clear perspective to Ukraine to join the European Union? I don't think he expected that. Did he expect us to decide on 50 billion uh, European support? 
all of these things, we went further than what he expected. We should not throw that away. And the main thing we have, besides all the military spending we do, besides all the support, the main thing that we've shown is our unity. And he's tested our unity two years in a row, and he will continue to test our unity. And he will always go further in testing us. How do we stick together? By the way, not only Russia. Others are testing that all the time. It's the main thing we have is our unity. And that we should cherish, but we should also ramp up our support. And that means today ramping up our industrial capacity to produce. We did not have that enough in Europe. We did not expect that we needed that. Uh, we need to speed that up in the short term, and then we need to maintain it, because I'm convinced that in the next decades, we, the Western world, will be challenged by Russia and by others, and we need to be ready for that. Thank you. Prime Minister Denkov, what's your take on that? I'll build up a little bit over what was said by Alexander. Just two, three years ago, we were discussing whether we have to try to unite Europeans for one or another topic. I think one of the lessons that we have learned is that not only about Ukraine, about the migration, about the other challenges that we have, it's absolutely clear now that Europe should be together, should work together, and when we do this, we'll be much more powerful than we are today. We just missed to start this years ago. Now we have to catch up in the way that we're discussed. Prime Minister Ferguson. Well, unfortunately, in, in a week from now, we have a two-year anniversary on the war in Europe, uh, uh, which means that we have one week to take uh, the next decisions. And we could decide to ensure that on Saturday, when war has been going on for two years, that Ukraine will receive more deliveries. Concrete deliveries on the ground. I will repeat, ammunition. Uh, we need to get more in our collision on the F-16 fighters. We need artillery directly to Ukraine. We need more drones. We need long-ranging missiles and so on. And uh, when I look at Europe during the COVID-19, we were able, together with the Americans, to produce a vaccine in a year instead of what it normally takes, eight to ten years. So in, in, I, I, I would really like to underline that on Saturday there should be new deliveries, new donations, a very, very clear military equipment to Ukraine instead of more words. Words will not solve this situation. And then secondly, production capacity. All over Europe, uh, we have some very good examples, for example, with Czech Republic, um, where we go to get, where we join efforts. Uh, I, I think it needs to, to, to be uh, the next uh, step. Um, and, and then finally, uh, we, I think the only thing Putin really respects is military force and our willingness to protect us. So Ukraine has to be promised that they belong to the European family when it comes to the European Union and the transatlantic alliance. So uh, on, on a short-term perspective, give them what they need. <laughs> and after that, uh, ensure Ukraine by welcoming them to the European Union and to NATO. Thank you. Secretary Clinton. So Prime Minister Fredrickson made it very clear. More weapons, welcome them to the European Union. That's a European Union issue. Welcome them to NATO is a US issue. Uh, will that happen? And when our children reflect on this, our grandchildren, will the United States have been there when it counted, or will it be, as Neil Ferguson said, an unreliable ally? Well, I don't think um, any of us could have listened to um, the three Ukrainian soldiers who shared their experiences with us uh, without really understanding we are in an existential crisis. I hate that when people use the word and they talk about you know, not having the right dress to wear. I mean, this is a really serious, historic challenge that we will either 
rise to meet or we will fail. And we don't have a whole lot of time to prove that we will rise and succeed, and the Ukrainians are paying the price for that hesitancy. And so I think if we will be much more focused on resolving all of these issues that we have talked about for two years, and I'm 100% with uh, Prime Minister Fredrickson. If everyone here who is in any position of authority, either in government or can influence government or in business or can influence business, will take these next week or two to literally figure out, okay, how do we unfreeze the assets? How do we get more ammunition and more other material quickly to the battlefront? How do we demonstrate the kind of resolve that is required when you face an existential crisis that we've already heard should be rightly called a world war already? So it's, it's challenging because we're coming out of a period, and some of us were talking about this earlier at another uh, gathering, we're coming out of a period where none of us wanted to be here again. You know, coming out of World War II, going into a Cold War, going into other military conflicts, finally seeing the Soviet Union disintegrate, thinking that China was on a constructive path to be a responsible stakeholder in the world community, on and on. None of us wanted to believe what we were seeing in front of our very eyes because it just was so disappointing to think we had to get back on war footing. You know, European countries spent three percent plus on defense budgets during the Cold War. That's a tough road to hoe, but it's going to have to be walked. Because as Ann Applebaum rightly said, we are in an existential crisis, not only because of Ukraine, but because very powerful forces in this world want to destroy our way of life. And, you know, when people say that, you can just see the recoil. Because who wants to believe it? Well, believe it. Russia, Iran, China, their little buddy, North Korea, is determined to undermine not just democracy, but literally the freedom that enables us, as we heard from one of our Ukrainian heroes, to walk down a street without fearing you'll hear an alarm and have to take shelter. So. I just think we are at this moment and every one of us can do a lot more, whether we're in government or not, or in any other position, to make the case and try to figure out what is it that we can do to respond to this crisis, because it's coming for all of us if we don't. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you all. Thank you particularly to our Ukrainian heroes. Um, thank you for coming. I hope that we have a less sober gathering next year. Thank you very much.